our Price Music Center lecture series this year, which has been a focus on Africa. Uh, in uh, September, I gave a talk about my uh, explorations of sacred music in Uganda and Ethiopia. And then in November, we had a Malian uh, griot played uh, the uh, Kora and had his fusion band from Pittsburgh. We called it the griot from, uh, I guess it was from Senegal, excuse me, from Senegal slash Pittsburgh. And that was a very interesting program. And tonight, we're going to have a talk by Sherry Rivers Ndaliko, who does her uh, work in Eastern Congo, which is one of the most, uh, well, unknown regions from the perspective of Americans. And what we do know is that it's a region of continuous war. This is the way the media presents this part of the world. Uh, volcanoes, uh, <laughs> um, uh, civil strife, and uh, uh, right on the border of a number of turbulent societies, South Sudan, Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda. And at the same time, what, uh, as I understand, what uh, Dr. Indalico has found there is a vibrant, youthful, and very creative society. And it's both of those aspects, the turbulence and the enormous creativity that she's going to talk about uh, tonight. I just wanted to mention one more program that we're going to have uh, in our series this year. Uh, as I said, it, it, the topic has been focus on Africa. And our final program at the end of March was to have been the great Zimbabwean Mbira player, Cosmos Bagaya, but his visa got uh, hung up. So instead, we're going to feature a Syrian Oud player. We're going to have a concert of the great traditional music of Syria on March 31st. Uh, not exactly Africa, but uh, the Oud is a very popular instrument in North Africa, and I think that it fits very nicely with our theme. So without further ado, I will, I will present Dr. Uh, Indalico, who will uh, take it from here. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. And um, as indicated by this gigantic sign, I am going to be talking about uh, music, conflict, and social change in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I'm really glad to be here giving this talk. This is a subject that I believe is very important. And there's a certain um, urgency to it, and I hope it will also be a really positive conversation. Um, I recognize that music is not always the most uh, obvious thing to talk about in the context of a violent crisis. Uh, but if you think about the reason why human beings make music, it actually makes a lot of sense to think about conflict through a musical lens. Uh, so in addition to the obvious activities of leisure and entertainment, uh, human beings make music to communicate, to tell our stories, to create a record of our existence and our experience, and to assert our agency as beings in the world. People from all over the world in all different cultural contexts and all different situations and circumstances partake in musical activity in times of peace, in times of war, joy, sorrow, birth, death, etc. Music is central to many, many cultures around the world. But I suggest that the stakes of music making are particularly high when we're talking about a conflict region, which is what we're going to be doing tonight. Uh, conflict is, of course, the result of human interaction, and that is my attempt to, to make a gender-neutral statement that's the equivalent of conflict is man-made, and therefore inevitably comes with politics, and of course with politics comes the need for a unifying, and, uh, unifying opinion with a compelling narrative. Most of the narratives include all kinds of facts and are presented as absolute or objective truth, but the narratives, at least the narratives that we see in the conflict of the Congo, are in fact held together by a single point of view. And these are really much more akin to stories than they are to absolute truths or objective uh, opinions. Uh, they might be true stories, but they are still stories. And the power of these stories is that they often aim to create the kind of truth with a capital T that is the one and only possibility. Uh, and in doing that, they become the basis for plans of action. So what I'm trying to get at here is that particularly in times of conflict, conflict, excuse me, telling, telling, what, telling one's own story is the most powerful action that a person can engage in. 
Simply put, the story that the world accepts determines how the world is going to intervene. So what I want to do tonight is actually tell you two different stories about Congo. Before we do that, though, I want to go back to the idea of music as a point of connection. And one of the important aspects of music is, of course, call and response. So I don't really want to stand here and lecture at you for this next hour or so. I would rather that we have a little bit of a call and response. So to do that in, a, in an appropriate way for the subject at hand, I'm going to teach you a Swahili word so we can get started with that. So there's a very important word, and you'll hear it in the lyrics of some of the songs that I'm going to be playing. The word is pamoja, and moja is the word for one. Pamoja means togetherness, the, the fact of being one. So if I ask you tuko pamoja, that means are we together? And if in fact we are together, your response is pamoja. Can we try this? Tuko pamoja. This is what it looks like for the visual learners in the group. <laughs> That's your word. Please imprint it in your memory. memory. I will be returning to it and asking you to go pamoja. That was not enthusiastic. Let's try one more time. To go pamoja. Okay, this is better. Good. So let's talk. Let's start with the first story about Congo. This one begins with facts and statistics that will be familiar to anyone who follows the news about Congo. And just for my own benefit, show of hands, how many people know what's going on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo? Okay, um, so let's start by getting oriented in space. Here we are in this gigantic continent of Africa. Anybody know where Congo is? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's the big yellow one in the middle. And for a close-up view, this is the map of the Congo. That dark green region on the, the darkest green region that says Kivu is uh, the site of the, uh, uh, large part of the conflict, and that's the, the geographic region that we're going to be talking about. That's where I've been doing my work, and the uh, songs and video examples that I'm going to be showing tonight come from North Kivu. In fact, you can see the dot that says Goma, and that is the city of our focus for this evening. This is what Goma looks like, an aerial shot of the city. Um, and this is another, uh, another common site in Goma. It sits at the, seat, at the base of this volcano, which is, in fact, an active volcano. It also has a very strong UN presence, which is part of the conflict. So that's a little bit of orientation in space, where I'm going to be talking about. Um, this region that I just showed you is the site of the deadliest conflict since the Second World War. And I have a lot of experience traveling and talking to oftentimes university students who express shock to realize that there's a conflict of that magnitude going on and people aren't aware of it. And this is, again, back to the stories that we hear and the stories that we don't hear. I'm just going to cite a couple of the most staggering statistics and then I'm going to play you a small news clip that will also uh, reiterate some of these same statistics. Uh, to date, the, the death toll in this conflict is somewhere between five and six million people. There have been millions more people forced off their land, displaced, and living in refugee camps with various, um, variously dire conditions there, the spread of a lot of disease. One of the characteristics of this conflict is, is uh, rampant sexual violence, which is one of the most powerful weapons of war. It's a way of destabilizing women and moving them off of the land that is, that is the source of the conflict. Another characteristic of this conflict is that many young children are forced into various rebel armies as child soldiers. So there are, these are, again, like I said, just the most um, staggering and overwhelming statistics, but they're very important things to keep in mind. And again, it's important to notice how many of us have heard about this and how many of us, of us have not heard about this conflict. Um, generally, the way this conflict is described is as an ethnic problem. So there's this idea that there are all of these different ethnic groups that are at war with each other that becomes very, very complicated and people find themselves confused generally when the conflict is described. I'm going to show you a clip that uh, I worked very hard to find a clip that was not uh, traumatic or overly graphic or um, too horrifying, which is hard to do with this conflict. But I want you to get a sense of the way that this story is mostly presented in, in uh, the media. So this is just a clip, this is from CNN, from their um, Inside Africa series. Hello everyone and welcome to Inside Africa. I'm Jim Clancy, in for Aisha Sisse. 
The Democratic Republic of Congo has been embroiled in bloody conflict for more than a decade. The violence has killed millions, displaced hundreds of thousands of others. Photographer Peter Biro turned his lens on the realities of the DR Congo late last year, and he hopes his photos will, in one way or another, shed light on one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. He shared with us some of his pictures and the stories that go with them. I think what's interesting is that people are often saying, uh, if you visit a, a, a camp or you're in a place where you see people that go through these terrible things, it's that they want to talk to you. Uh, they often come up and say, uh, are you a photographer, are you a journalist, are you, uh, you know, can you, tell, can you bring our story to the world? Being photographed is also a moment of, you know, an opportunity to, to, uh, to tell the story. I work uh, for an aid organization called the International Rescue Committee, um, and we provide humanitarian assistance to uh, displaced people and refugees uh, around the world. Congo is, is a country where we have worked uh, since 1996, providing aid across the country. It's one of the most urgent humanitarian crisis uh, right now, with a massive death toll with rampant poverty and a war that's been allowed to continue uh, for a very long time, in, in particularly in the eastern part of the country. At the moment, it's estimated that 1.8 million people live in, in camps, are displaced, are forced to flee their homes, are living in the bush, or or, or forced to to, um, to live in, in these large displacement camps. How many people want to go to you afraid of souls? Uh, it's not a very inviting picture, right? And uh, one of the things that I find is that framing the, con the conflict as an ethnic war does this thing of creating distance. It creates an impossibly complex situation that makes it very difficult for people to imagine intervening. And generally, reports like this that have these horrifying and staggering statistics have one of two results on people. The first is utter overwhelm. People have a sense of, of sort of guilt that something of this magnitude is going on and a sense of powerlessness to do anything about it. And there's this sort of uncomfortable pause and then a sort of change of subject and life carries on because what, what is any one of us going to do about something that's affecting this many people in such a profound way? The second response uh, that some people do have to stories like this is to want to go and help and want to intervene. And most of the time, the way that that takes place is through humanitarian intervention and humanitarian aid, and you saw an example of that from the photographer who was talking about working for one of the largest international uh, NGOs or non-governmental organizations, humanitarian organizations that's working in the region. So humanitarian aid is extremely important, and this is one aspect of social change, and this is one aspect of social change in Congo that intersects with music, and we're going to talk about that. Um, people certainly need access to shelter, to food, to medicine, to clothing, to all of the things that meet material needs. And meeting these needs does, in the case of a conflict, result in some, some manner of change for people's lives. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, oftentimes when we think about change in the face of conflict, this type of humanitarian intervention seems like the starting place because it addresses what we perceive as important uh, and obvious needs. And I don't want to undermine the importance of humanitarian interventions, but I want to talk about them in a little bit more uh, depth. Because it's also important to point out that these kinds of material solutions, uh, that they do bring some sort of change, but it's a change that comes from the outside. It's not a change that comes from within a community. And that's an important distinction. I want to actually illustrate the example and the impacts of change that comes from outside with the musical example. And this, this is an example that comes from a recent project, and I'll tell you more about the project in a little while. Um, but many people are surprised to hear that medical and disaster relief organizations, how many people have heard of the Red Cross? How many people think the Red Cross produces musical albums? Okay, so they do. And they are not alone. This is a very popular thing for emergency and medical relief organizations to try to uh, educate and sensitize populations through the use of music. 
and it's considered a really potent means of education, of communication, especially for non-literate populations. Music is comparatively easy to disseminate, especially where radios are popular. And so there's this new practice, and there's a lot of enthusiasm by uh, humanitarian organizations, by disaster relief organizations, and by medical organizations to record songs, record albums, make films in partnership with local populations, and then hold them up as some sort of manifestation of social change in a uh, in a conflict region. So I want to play you one example of a song that was created like this. This is a song addressing the problem of cholera, which was uh, recently a large epidemic that broke out in one of the refugee camps in the region that I was just showing you pictures of. So here is uh, one song recently recorded by Congolese artists to address the issue of cholera. And you'll see the lyrics. <laughs> Song. 
And I'm going to come back in a minute to telling you the backstory behind this song. But before we do that, I want to start into my second story about Congo. This one, just to keep us located, we're talking about the same geographic region, um, same exact city. Um, this story starts with a narrative that is told by the local population about the conflict that's taking place. So I want us to, to take a couple of minutes. This is about a seven minute short clip that, um, that tells the story from a different perspective. Same conflict, same region. This is called Dream Under Fire and it's from the Art on the Frontline series and it will, I will tell you a little bit more about that series in a moment. Please do pay attention to the presence and the role of music in this. Je dois faire. 
j'ai tweeté, j'ai Facebooké parce que je pense que ça fait partie aussi de mon travail. Et il y a des gens, il y a des frères, il y a des amis qui ne sont pas là, qui ne savent vraiment pas ce qui se passe là. Et à travers ces réseaux sociaux, moi je pense qu'ils étaient au courant vraiment du déroulement des, des événements qui s'est passé ici. Tous les messages que je, que je mettais en ligne, c'est vrai qu'il y avait des gens qui réagissaient, mais il y avait des réactions tout à fait différentes. Il y a des gens qui, qui commentaient sur mon mur, disant que, <rire> disant que euh, tu tweets ou tu fais bon, ce bon, parce que ce sont tes frères et tout. <rire> moi, je me dis que non, ce n'est pas que ce sont mes frères, mais moi, je dis la réalité. <rire> to students and audiences, and oftentimes particularly young people, but all audiences, many of them report feeling very differently towards their Congolese peers, and instead of the kind of alienation that comes through with overwhelming narratives of statistics of violence and rape and, and death and suffering, this clip often inspires a sense of connection with or even respect for the two actual Congolese individuals who you get to sort of meet through the film. 
Um, and if, if not a sense of connection, at the very least, a personal sense, not only of the conditions of living under threat of violence, but of the dreams and aspirations that violence cannot completely erase. In other words, the humanity of the people whose lives are, are being talked about in these kinds of stories comes through in a very different way when they have the power to tell their own stories. And if we can compare and contrast this further with the first example, where people were asking a foreigner to represent their stories for them, as opposed to taking the opportunity to try and represent their own stories themselves and exhibit their own agency, there's something very significant about that. Um, and as you can tell, music is a vibrant part of the way that people represent their stories. It's also a vibrant part of daily life. You can see lots of the outside, outside concerts. Those are free and open to the public. That's part of the sort of soundscape of the city at any given time. Um, one of the things that you might have noticed, and in certainly a key player in this last story of Congo that we were just talking about, is the Yole Africa Cultural Center. This is a center that uh, is supports young people in learning uh, video arts, digital arts, film and video production, music, dance, and journalism. As you can tell, those two students had gone, gotten much of their training from the Yale Africa Cultural Center. It was founded in 2000 at a time where most of the non-essential services, so that includes schools, it includes all cultural centers, it includes basically anywhere that young people could go to um, to learn, to develop critical thinking skills, to get education, or to develop a positive sense of self. All of those things were shut down as a result of this conflict. And so the choices that were left for young people were to either join a rebel army, get killed by a rebel army, or flee the country as a refugee. And neither of those is a very positive opportunity. And uh, so the idea of Yale Africa, and here you can see some pictures of the center, was to create a space where young people could come and they could gain the skills necessary to be critical participants in society in a positive and constructive and nonviolent way. Um, so Yoli Africa hosts many activities. One of the very popular activities is the jam session. This brings together a crowd of about 600 people and happens between one and once and twice a month all year long. This is the primary venue for musical performance in uh, in this part of Congo. It is also the primary place where young people get training in music. And so obviously establishing a cultural center in the middle of a conflict is a political gesture in and of itself, so it's not surprising that the young people who come through this cultural center have uh, a heightened awareness of their own political agency and of the necessity of the kinds of skills that they're developing through the Yale Africa Cultural Center. I should say that the center was founded in 2000 and uh, currently serves over 24,000 youth every year, so it has a, a significant impact in the region. Many of the young people who got their training at Yole Africa do not go on to have uh, professional careers as artists, but go into other domains. There are a lot of people who get training at Yole Africa and then they go on to I work in politics, to work in law, to work in medicine, to uh, be business people, to do all kinds of different things, but they cite, we actually did a 10 year anniversary video not so long ago and, and tracked down a lot of uh, previous participants and many of them cite the skills they learned at Yale Africa as what allows them to be effective in whatever capacity. So it's not really a project of training professional artists, it's a project of recognizing that through creative activity, we can learn certain skills that are not always um, teachable through other, through other means. So this is the cultural center that supports the Art on the Frontline series. This is the cultural center that's trained the people who are making those videos, the people who are featured in those videos. And this is a cultural center that is profoundly dedicated to making sure that other stories about Congo are available so that when people decide that they do want to participate and intervene in the conflict, there are other ways that people can do that that don't come with imposing external ideas onto people. Um, in all of the activities that Yoli Africa does, there are a lot of interesting stories. I'm going to try and limit us to talking more about the musical part of the equation just for the sake of time. Um, and the power of music itself is really evident in many of the different activities of Yule Africa. For some people, participating in music is transformative on a personal or psychological level, and I want to give you an example of that. Um, 
uh, in, I think, 2006. This was part of the Tomba Mani project. This was when Yole Africa called together all of the most important local artists and musicians, I should say, in the region uh, to do a song together speaking out about the war and standing for and demanding peace. Uh, this was the first time that the musicians had worked collaboratively together, and it was a really, really big deal. It would be like all the big superstars of the hip-hop world coming together, uniting their voices in one particular song. So this is a big deal. The final recording and filming of this song took place in a region where there were many uh, child, or former child soldiers who had managed to leave the various armies that they were in but had not yet managed to reintegrate into the community and were having a really difficult time reintegrating. And so the idea was to bring musicians and to do a performance that would, that would result in the filming of a video, but would also be a performance for these people who are not generally considered um, important enough to be performed for. So that was supposed to be a stance of empowerment in and of itself. What happened, musicians were, were singing, the video shoot was going really well, and as the young people were, got more and more familiar with the song, and they started sort of singing along, and they started dancing a little bit, and they were getting closer and closer and closer to the camera, because it was such a magnetic scene, and finally the director said, just get into the scene, and so they became part of the video, and when the final version of the video was edited, it was taken back to that same place to be premiered, uh, so that the people who were in it could see it first. And it was a profound moment, because it was the first time for a lot of these young people that they had ever actually seen an image of themselves doing something other than carrying weapons and threatening and menacing people. And the response among young people was the, the, the option, the opportunity to see themselves in a different light, to actually imagine what they look like doing something positive, doing something socially contributive, doing something that other people value, was a profound shift for them that allowed them to imagine actually engaging in the world in a different way. It's a very hard thing to engage in the world in a way that you can't imagine, and being able to uh, see their bodies dancing, to be able to hear their voices as part of something that was collectively a beautiful piece and a beautiful video was a, was a really radical shift. So that's an example of what I'm talking about in terms of the sort of internal or psychological transformative power of participating in music. Um, and of course this is true under any conditions, and like I said at the beginning, it's just a little bit escalated in, in a situation of conflict where there are so few alternatives. Um, it's equally, um, uh, it's equally empowering for a lot of people, or equally transformative, I should say, in uh, external ways also. There are a lot of examples of the way that music creates a platform for people to engage in the world in ways that they otherwise wouldn't have the power to do. And the video that we just saw shows quite a few examples of that. Young people offering very potent uh, social critiques, offering critiques of politicians, offering, offering critiques of the military, to audiences where high levels of politicians and, and uh, military leaders are present. And listening to them, which is unprecedented and is not something that those same young people would be able to achieve through any other means besides music. So the music as a platform for elevating their voice and allowing them to, to insert their voice into these conversations where they have something to say. And oftentimes what they have to say is a criticism and a critique, which is very, very important. But again, because they're bringing that critique musically, it's able to, um, it comes to ears that would not otherwise hear it if they were trying to do that through politics or through some sort of legal venues. Um, so those are some of the some of the grossly oversimplified ways that music can be transformative within the activities that Yule Africa organizes. Um, and when I was thinking about this, trying to organize my thoughts to, to share with you this evening, I realized that in in many for the many of the same reasons that we make music that I listed at the beginning, are the same reasons that music is so powerful in conflict regions, right? So it connects us across unexpected divides. Music has an ability to bring people together, to get people united, uh, despite obstacles that are otherwise insurmountable. It provides a record of existence that is often erased from official versions of history. I don't think I need to explain what I mean by that. And it certainly calls attention to agency where we might otherwise only encounter stories of powerless victims who need people to speak on their behalf. For all of these reasons, music is very attractive to people who approach social change in very, very different ways. And I want to return now to the cholera song that I, it's actually called Soja to now, I should call it by its name, um, that, we, that we heard a little minute ago. Here it is, just a little, 
audio refresher. We're not gonna play the whole thing. quite a bit of controversy around the production of this song because um, the way that it came about was that the uh, humanitarian and disaster relief organizations that I mentioned earlier uh, wanted to create the song about cholera. They decided that they don't have the qualifications to really do that. They're not trained in any aspect of culture production and so they wanted to partner with a reputable local organization that of course is really Africa. And the agreement was that they wanted young people to be able to actually tell their own stories in their own voices and to, to provide solutions to how cholera could, how, how an end could be brought to the cholera epidemic. And so Yole Africa was supposed to gather the musicians, supposed to explain the competition. The prize for the competition was a sizable cash prize, a professional recording contract, uh, national uh, radio play and a regional tour to perform the song. So a significant, significant prize. And uh, there was an agreement that there would be a five member jury of qualified artists and one representative of the NGO just so that they could have a face on the jury. So that was all fine and good. Everything went according to plan until the five final songs were selected and at the public presentation of the finalist songs, what came to light was that the lyrics that the young people were writing basically suggested that because this is an economically motivated conflict that is driven by a Western uh, economic need, the best way to bring an end to cholera is for people not to support the Western governments that are actually arming and training the rebel militias that are forcing people off of their land, which is why they end up in refugee camps. And so they said, if you really want to stop cholera, sort out your own business. And you can imagine that that wasn't a very welcome message. Uh, and the NGO quickly broke the contract and said, oh, no, 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 this isn't good. And they went and found a theater troupe, not a music group, a theater troupe, and commissioned them to write the song that we just heard, which is about really the five important moments when one needs to wash one's hands. So a, an important message, it is important to wash hands, uh, hard to do in refugee camps where there's no water, but, um, but the fact still stands that it is not an accurate manifestation of what local people are trying to say as their opinion on how to bring an end to color. And in that sense, very, very disturbing. It is being marketed currently as a representation of local voice. It's in a local language. They gave considerable musical freedom. There is freedom of genre. There is all kinds of freedom in that sense. Um, so, and the artists who made it signed a contract, and so they don't actually have the right to say, well, well, you know, there's this whole other story. I have the right to say that, fortunately, um, but I'm not saying it on the radio where this song is playing. So, in the, in the popular imagination, this is a good representation of local opinion. Um, this is um, one of the dynamics that prompted Yole Africa to launch the Art on the Frontline series. This is not the first time something like this has happened, but it's the most recent. And uh, the idea was to start a series that would allow uh, people to really reclaim the potential power of music as a medium of telling uncensored local stories. And not just telling them to a local population, but telling them to anyone, anywhere who wants to listen. So I want to start by listening to one of the early episodes of this uh, series, and I would like to also let you know that the first number of episodes in this series are in fact music videos that were made of the songs that were finalists for this competition as a way of giving a platform for those opinions to be aired as well. So this uh, song is called Uhaki, and see, we will watch at least a part of this video. Sauvons l'Afrique de l'injustice, que notre terre retrouve ses astuces, l'égalité de sexe, l'indifférence des rangs sociales. 
que la justice soit mon problème. Si c'est mieux que mon assiette, c'est la sève, c'est mon âme zéki. Qui m'a guidé à tout, n'a pas qu'à vite et à haki. Qui n'a pas pu voir pour nous, pas 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 ça m'a qui. On gagne, 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 on g
So in reviving this poem that he wrote, they're making also a very strong political statement. You'll recognize some of the same musical, uh, musical tendencies that I was just talking about. Again, this is a way of talking to the world at large. This is not a way of talking to an isolated group of Congolese who exist um, in a, in a, far away from the rest of the world. So let's just watch, this is just a, a short clip of uh, one of the more recent episodes. Chances are, and this is what I've seen, is that people who decide to take action based on the inspiration they take from the music take action that's based on respect for the strength and the dignity and the humanity of the people whose lives are being represented and who are having the opportunity to tell their own story. And if actions are based on respect for strength and for people's dignity, then they're much likely to be based on what people are actually asking for but then what people are actually saying rather than on imposing uh, ideas from the outside. And I realize this sounds like a tremendously idealistic scenario, but it's actually something that's starting to happen, and especially between American and Congolese young people. Uh, and for many of the people who are joining this movement that has increasing momentum, music has actually been the first point of connection that has opened their ears and then their eyes to what's going on in the world around them. Many people, like I said, are horrified to realize that there's a conflict of this magnitude taking place in the world that we live in right now, and most of us aren't even aware of it. And what's worse is that most of us are directly implicated, because the reason this conflict is happening is from minerals that we consume disproportionately. These are the minerals that go in cell phones, these are the minerals that go in laptops, these are the minerals that go in digital cameras and automobiles and airplanes and all of those things that most of us rely on. I will spare you my usual question of how many people have a cell phone or a laptop, but I imagine that we're in good company of people who own these devices. And the, uh, force, the illicit extraction of the minerals for those devices is largely what's fueling this conflict. So the idea of getting involved in a way that empowers the people on the ground is a particularly relevant thing, especially in this particular country that is contributing so directly to the uh, resource war that's taking place. Um, but despite the excitement that I feel in particular about this trend of connection between American and Congolese youth, it's really more important that with or without the partnership of the Americans, the Congolese are, are working very hard to transform their own reality. And perhaps if I had started with that last clip and shown you the music performances and shown you the dance scenes, if I had asked how many want to go to Congo, maybe I would have gotten a few more takers. Um, what we've seen at breakneck speed, and I can't believe how much time has already gone by, are some examples of different takes on the intersection of music with social change in this particular conflict. 
Uh, and if I can leave you with one thought, it is a very simple observation, that of all the reasons human beings make music, I listed connection, I listed storytelling, I listed a sense of belonging. In the face of conflict, the active agency, the act of asserting one's own voice in the world is the most powerful. And as a consumer of music, I believe it is really important that we remember that the agency that we're hearing here goes both ways, and that it's a call, and that it also hopefully elicits in some respect or another a response. Thank you very much. So um, th I selected exclusively from the Art on the Frontline series, which to date does not have as many women in the musical groups. There are women who are featured in some of the short documentaries um, that I was a little heartbroken, but I didn't have time to show everything. I will say that for people who do feel inspired to do some small thing to get involved, subscribing to this series, although this is shameless publication, is actually really useful. The more publicity we get for the series, the more we're able to amplify these stories and the more impact that has. So if you want to do something, YouTube, search hard on the front line, it comes up. You can subscribe every other Thursday, there's a new episode. Back to your question, um, there are quite a few other videos that do actually, that do feature women. There's a little bit of tension in this region about women participating in what are considered hip hop arts. And that's something that Yule Africa is addressing and one of the um, most powerful steps we've taken to address this is by starting a choir at the Cultural Center, and that has brought in quite a few women and girls. The tension exists mostly with families who are a little bit wary of their, of their daughters and the young women in the family participating in something that's um, perceived as a genre that is not always um, favorable in the way that it represents women, and so there's some, there's some tension with a lot of families who don't want their daughters to participate. Uh, and what we've tried to do is create ways for women and girls to become more integrated into other activities at Yole Africa so that families can see the positive impacts of that on the young women and the tensions can start to, to resolve. We've had um, a really interesting time. We started a choir and that was originally designed as a women's choir and it became so popular that the men wanted to participate too and we've opened it up now. It is now a a choir that welcomes everybody, but there's a core of women uh, with, a, with a very wide age range. We have women from their late 60s and women from their early teens and everybody in between. And the community that started to form within that choir is really opening up doors for more women to come in and to start to participate. Um, so the, the, the gender dynamic is shifting. One of the things that we've been doing with the choir that's particularly exciting is that we we um, have been partnering with some of the young people who are studying cinema, and they make short films about things that are going on locally that are relevant. And we've been uh, doing vocal soundtracks and singing them live in different parts of the city and projecting films and having a choir of local voices sing the sound that accompanies the film. And that is starting to sort of bridge in the direction of edgier performance, but people are really appreciating the impact of that and, and the idea of giving voice in the most literal sense uh, to a local representation. So we're moving in a direction that will hopefully result in more women participating in the actual music. Um, the, the last clip that I showed you does feature an incredible woman vocalist close to the end, and I just, for the sake of time, didn't show that part. Um, but but there, is a, there is a gender discrepancy that we're working to cover, uh, to, to address, and it's, it's leading towards an intervention in, in this sort of genre of music, and it's starting with a choral intervention. How much are women, uh, in, in native Congolese women, how much are they involved with the music of the country? Because hip hop is an important, it's pretty much important. Uh, the native Congolese music, how much are women uh, at the core of that? Yes, that's a great question. So um, let me answer that in two different ways. Congolese society is, is uh, by and large, very, 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 um, much organized around the strength and the centrality of women. 
One of the things that I often point out is the reason that the epidemic of rape and sexual violence is so escalated in Congo is not because women are devalued, it's because women hold such value in society that that's the only way to destabilize the entire society. So women are central in all activities across the board, including music um, in, in Congo, and women are highly respected in all of these activities. So that's an important piece of context that isn't always evident. Uh, and in terms of traditional music in the region that we're talking about right now, there is not a vibrant traditional music scene. That's one of the many things that has been uh, completely disrupted by this ongoing conflict. And um, and there's a it's it's it exists in some in some sort of settings, but it's not part of mainstream culture the way that it is in other places or that it was historically. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. That's another really good question. Uh, the response to that is much like their response to the to the cholera epidemic. Yes, there are songs that address HIV AIDS, but not in the way that most uh, Western sponsors want to see. And that's actually been another point of tension with the cultural center. We've had a lot of offers for significant financial support if the young people will do an AIDS album. And there are constraints around that that we've never been willing to accept. Um, but there are songs that talk about that talk about um, that talk about everything that's relevant to HIV and AIDS in a way that makes perfect sense to a local audience. But it doesn't have the same sort of prescriptive messages that a lot of the other albums that we hear that are sort of you know awareness albums. Yeah. Um, one of the confusing things that I've noticed about This is all 100% owned by everybody who you just saw represented. Period. Always. Yeah. And that's, it is a really central issue because, and that's why um, when I was talking about partnership, I kind of can't help myself but put it in these kinds of in, you know, uh, quotations because partnership generally does not mean ownership. It generally means a higher than normal fee in local terms and then ownership by whatever organization produced the fees. And that is um, absolutely one of the core values of Really Africa is that, is that, and that's part of why we don't have as much money to promote these materials, right? Because because everything goes into creating them and making sure that they stay they stay as part of the wealth of the local community. Um, following your critique around humanitarian aid, mm -hmm. sort of um, making having a negative impact in the community there, and also seeing references to colonization and sort of resistance to colonization. Um, I wonder if, if you are you doing any work within the United States to inform the American consumer around colonization and tax? Yes. Yes, I'm um, doing so we actually are doing a lot of work. Part of my contribution to that is writing a book detailing this in great length. There are also a couple of film projects that we're making that are directed um, specifically towards Western audiences, not as an attack, not as a way of you know saying this is bad stuff. It's very clear that the intention behind all of these projects is genuinely good, and it's genuinely based on compassion and on a desire to alleviate suffering in a really dire condition. And so the idea is to suggest ways that that might be done more effectively, and you know take as a bottom, as, a, as a, an assumption that people are generally not intervening because they want to cause harm. It's generally a, an unintended consequence of actions. So yes, we're working on, on certain things about that. And I would be happy to give you more details afterwards about any of those projects. Yeah. Any other questions? This is a strange question you might not be able to answer. <coughs> At the end, one of the things you talked about was uh, the family. So um, there's no such thing as a typical life. That's part of that's part of the <laughs> part of the story. Africa 
is open to absolutely everybody, regardless of age and socioeconomic background and language and ethnic identity or religion or gender or any of the other divisive categories that I could, that I could think of. And so we have some of the uh, young people from the wealthiest and uh, most powerful families, and we have people who are street children. And the idea is that it's by virtue of their, their humanity that they're part of this community and not by virtue of any sort of class distinction or language distinction. So the difference in the daily life of any given person is pretty dramatic. It, it really encompasses uh, the whole of the community. And part of, part of the way we're trying to make that clear is in some of the other profile episodes that are, that are part of this series. There's one that's uh, recently been gaining some popularity about a young boy from a very poor family who goes to school during the day and as soon as school's over he comes home and he starts renting out his bicycle for somewhere between 25 and 75 cents depending on how many meters people are going to ride back and forth and he's uh, able to pay his school fees and his school uniforms and his books and his shoes and everything with this little entrepreneurial business that he started. So that's the day in the life of that particular person. We also have a profile that that talks about a school teacher who's in a dance competition and he's you know, much more educated, he's uh, in a different position in society, and so collectively through these small portraits we're trying to sort of paint pictures of the, the daily lives of a very, very diverse group of people who you know, come together around this idea of, of wanting to have a critical impact in their environment. But some of these people are street children, many of them are orphans, many of them have very traumatic situations in their past, and some of them are growing up in a kind of luxury that's not even imaginable in the United States. So the, the disparity between wealthy and poor in Congo is, is among the greatest in the, in the world. The wealthy in Congo, it's a kind of wealth that includes a fleet of private jets and flying to Brussels to go shopping and come home for dinner. And the, the poor are unbelievably, unbelievably poor. So there's a, there's a really, really big window and the, the entire population in some sense is represented in the young people in early Africa. One of the things that is really important to the organization is not to stigmatize people. So we are never, um, and this is another way we lose a lot of funding because we won't release statistics about how many rape victims or how many child soldiers because that ends up stigmatizing them and not integrating them into the community. There are a lot of NGOs that rehabilitate specific groups of people and one of the consequences, unintended consequences of that can be that people say, oh look, there go the rape victims and there go the child soldiers and that's not actually integration, that's stigmatization of a different variety and so I try really hard not to do that. Um, and the stories that, that do get told through this series are stories of people who, who want to share their story and their peers want to make a, make a profile about them. So we're trying to, trying to just offer a patchwork that gives people a better sense of the range of lives that people live in this place. Hope that answered. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you explain the concept just more in depth? I can explain it a little bit more in depth. Um, the, the through line of the conflict is that it's economically motivated. There are vast repositories of very, very um, coveted minerals in the regions that I showed you at the beginning, the Kibu region, those minerals go, like I said, in all portable electronic devices. And the way that things stand right now, multinational corporations find it easier to extract those minerals illicitly rather than to regulate the extraction of minerals. There's a wonderful short film that's 20 minutes long that goes in tremendous detail. It talks about the history of the conflict and, and all of the various governments that are supporting the conflict um, without their populations necessarily being aware of that. But the, the gist of it is that the conflict is, uh, is around access to minerals that are being put in the kinds of devices that are part of multi-billion dollar industries. And it's, um, like I said, thus far been less expensive for corporations to support or not to require the regulation of the extraction of minerals. And so people are, are forcing other people off land and digging mines and forcing women and children and men and everybody to work in these mines, working incredibly brutal hours and then not, not being paid anything and being beaten and being slaughtered and being raped as a way of exerting power. Um, and if you Google Congo conflict, you will get lots and lots and lots of 
descriptions of why this is an ethnically motivated conflict, the reason that you get those descriptions is that the way that um, the way that the connection works between multinational corporations and local armies is along ethnic lines, and that's the best way to pit people against each other, but the motivation for the fighting is not ethnic. The motivation is economic. The, com the composition of many of the armies is ethnic, but the motivation for the conflict is largely economic, and I would be happy to um, give you a recommendation of a film that's called Crisis in the Congo, and it's by Friends of the Congo. It's 20 minutes, it's free, it's online, and it explains in much greater depth. National level is one of the really fraught things in Congo right now. That's, that's part of the problem is that there's not a particularly galvanized sense of national functionality. Um, on a regional level, there is discussion of these songs. It is not so much promoted by government bodies, but by other arts organizations that are working towards social change. So there's a network of, of organizations in the Great Lakes region, including members in Congo, in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Kenya, in Uganda. Um, working to to have some of these pieces migrate, to have the artists talk to one another, that has not resulted in a single anthem. Um, but the but the notion of the power of music is something that's gaining increasing momentum. But again, more through cultural channels than through um, official or political channels. Yeah, well, what are the cultural channels? Um, radio. Uh, I was recently in Uganda. And the internet is so slow in Kampala. I mean, something a, a, a resource like YouTube is virtually useless. You can't you can't access that way. And very few people have to do it anyway. A lot of people have everyone has cell phones. Yes, but and that's it. Smartphones. Oh, but a lot of them are now, at least in Congo, a lot of them are. A lot of them are, and a lot of people access all of these things so through Facebook. Facebook. Absolutely. Through Facebook on their cell phones. Uh, through Facebook on their cell phones. Well, that's their Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's how a lot of this goes. And then through, you know, public manifestations, that's what I was talking about, projecting films in public spaces, you know, that's a, that's a really impactful way of doing things. That's, um, you know, doesn't have the same reach as Facebook on a cell phone, but it has a pretty sizable impact uh, in dense urban environments, so that's a, that's a big strategy. And then, um, you know, the idea is that these pieces will also reach a Western audience in some sense, so that's obviously not a problem with, with playing YouTube videos. Uh, but Facebook is really, is really. If I can ask just one other question. Um, and the lyrics are going by very, very fast. Yes. But I don't know about you all. I have a little trouble reading all those words. But, you know, I see a lot of cries for justice and anti corruption. But there's not. A, and, and then the, the first one that we saw dealt with the NGOs. Mm -hmm. And they're the villains. And it said they're the colonizers. They're, they're one additional it, it, villain, yes. But they're the only ones that was mentioned besides politicians, which as you yourself said, sort of a general vague term for anyone who has a hand in the bill. But um, you know, what about specifically addressing Microsoft? Uh, and I don't, I don't see this kind of... Yeah, hello. Okay. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you, yeah. Uh, well, I didn't know I was taking a position. I'm just asking the question, but I'm glad that you agree. Well, I just made it. <laughs> So, um, so a lot of the history of social critique through music in Congo has come through sort of proverbs and through hyperbole, and there's been a lot of indirect critique, and it's moving more and more and more towards a direct critique. And I wouldn't be surprised if, as that trend continues, it becomes even more overt and even more direct. But as as you know, 
if this had been a different presentation about the sort of evolution of social critique in music in Congo, this is already very, very uh, overt. This is very direct comparatively. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a process. There's also, um, yeah, I think it's a process. That's a great question. That's a really, really good question. So Congo has approximately 487 indigenous languages. And the official language of Congo, which was colonized by Belgium, is French. So anything that happens in official government capacity takes place in French. So everybody, well, a vast majority of people speak some level of French from totally fluent to you know, functional. Um, French is part of the language of the, uh, of the linguistic fabric of the country, but then people also often speak a number of other languages that are their mother tongues and their indigenous languages, and so most people have you know, a handful of languages at their disposal, and when they're singing or expressing themselves, oftentimes they'll call on many different languages. And one of the things that happens in these kinds of projects when artists are free to express themselves is they will often put certain sections in French because they want to be sure that at least a part of the Western world can understand them directly, and other sections in local languages if that's an easier or, or a more effective way, or if they want to sort of take a, a stand of linguistic radicalism. Uh, one of the things that's pretty, pretty common in the NGO type projects is that they insist that people sing in indigenous languages, that they want to try and claim authenticity because they want to make sure that people are singing in indigenous non-colonial languages. And that becomes another way of marketing the product as authentic voice, as people speaking the way they would speak to one another. Um, so it's actually oftentimes the opposite of what one would expect, that it is, it is um, more often the Western organizations that require people to speak in indigenous languages and if people are given choice, they call on many different languages as, as is the habit in daily conversation. And in any given conversation, a person can go through you know, two or three or four languages in one sentence, depending on what they're talking about. So the kind of language switching that's in there is very much a reflection of people's everyday style of communicating. Pardon? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. Any other questions? Have I answered everything? Oh, no, oh, nope, there's another one up there. <laughs> I have no idea. That's what. That's how the mainstream media continues to present the conflict, and it's a way of making it very confusing. Um, what that usually refers to is that there are people who. So the way that Africa was carved up was was an imposition of national boundaries on groups of people who had other ways of identifying, and those other ways of identifying are usually called ethnic identities. And so in any given country, there are usually multiple ethnicities of people who coexist. And so when there's tension between people from two different ethnic groups, it's labeled ethnic tension regardless of, of, of whether ethnicity is actually the reason that people are in tension, or if people just happen to be from different ethnic groups. And historically, there is certain tension that is very much exists around ethnicity, but that oftentimes becomes a way of labeling conflicts that are not about ethnicity. So of the things that you listed, tribal affiliation aligns with ethnicity. Religion often does, but is not, not automatically married to ethnicity. Language is certain, so <laughs> French is not an ethnic language, but the indigenous languages that I was talking about do align with certain ethnic groups. All of those kinds of components of identity are what we would call, what we would call ethnic identity. But people have so many different identities, right? So one of, the, one of the things that's really interesting is if you're in the city of Goma, in the east of Congo, people will identify as 
Nande or as some specific ethnic group. But then if they go to the west side of the country, which is a five hour flight away, then suddenly they're just from the east, right? But then if they leave Congo and they go to say Senegal, then they're from Congo and suddenly they're talking about a national identity, right? But then if they leave Congo and go to Europe or America, then suddenly they're African. Right? So there's this series of different identities, and all of those are all true at the same time in all of those cases. It's which aspect people choose to reference because it's which aspect is relevant to what part of themselves they're trying to talk about, right? And so that's, that's why ethnicity is a true component of a lot of this conflict, but it's not always the part that's motivating the conflict. And that's where things get confused, and that's why it's convenient to say, oh, it's an ethnic conflict, because nobody's going to intervene in somebody else's ethnic conflict. It's, I mean, how, how would you ever do that, right? But if we say it's an economic conflict, and we're all implicated because we all buy the things that are motivating the conflict, suddenly there's a really different burden on people. So there's a real power in, in labeling it as an ethnic conflict. It makes it between those savage Congolese who live in the heart of darkness, and you know, it would be nice to be able to do something, but what can we ever really do? And if we talk about, there might be ethnic armies, yeah, but we're talking about an economic conflict that has everything to do with global interconnectedness and consumer choices here, all of a sudden the question of what we can do takes on a very, very different light. So, um, so that's how the word ethnicity is used, and it is really hard to discern what people mean when they call it an ethnic conflict. And that's my best explanation that I can offer you. Yeah. What's your connection to Congo? That's a great question. Um, I have a lot of different connections to Congo. It was uh, one place that I landed as a result of an extensive cross-continental research project I was doing, and I got there despite extraordinary odds, and uh, simultaneously had one of those personally transformative experiences that are impossible to explain, uh, that was one of the moments where my life sort of took a different direction, and I also had one of those incredibly enlightening moments in my own research that allowed me to dig in very deeply and get, over time, very much connected to the community that also did result in certain personal connections, including marriage and now family connections that are there, and, and trying to establish a life that exists back and forth between here and Congo. So it's, it's now a familial, personal connection, and it also has this sort of, um, it's clearly directly related to my work, and it's somewhere where I find that there are certain meaningful contributions that I can make to an issue that I think is of urgent global importance. Who funds Yole Africa? Want to make a contribution? Um, <laughs> who funds Yole Africa? Well, we have a number of different funding strategies. A lot of them are involve a lot of grant writing. I refer to contributions that I can make in this conflict, and grant writing is unfortunately one of them. Um, so we do apply for a fair number of grants. We also have a history as an organization of refusing money if it comes with uh, constraints of any kind that we feel would limit the creativity and result in censorship of what the young people are producing. So we have had some really successful uh, funders, most of them in Europe, a few in the United States. Um, and we are always actively developing new strategies because we, I don't think we've ever yet actually met our entire annual budget. And so it's, uh, it's a labor of love. The founder of Billy Africa, who just so happens to be in the audience tonight, um, has a film production company that offers a percentage of any, any proceeds from any film back to the cultural center. There are other artists who um, have the ability to do that, who make certain contributions. That's certainly not enough to sustain the organization. A lot of the Yule Africa staff become volunteers every time we run out of money, and yet they never will go elsewhere to look for jobs, so there's a real sense of fulfillment in the work that they do there. So through efforts by various people, we managed to get by, and we're always looking for um, people who are interested in supporting this kind of work um, without putting unnecessary constraints on what comes out of it. So it's, a, it's an ongoing struggle, and because of the statistics, because of the numbers that Yolai Africa serves, it's actually a very well-positioned organization to get a lot of bigger funding, and a lot of that funding comes with compromises that are um, not the interesting to the organization. So it's a, it's a struggle.
question. I um, I don't want to speak for anybody. I don't want to represent. I don't want to misrepresent anybody's opinion. I'll say that from what I'm able to observe, the way that fear exists as a result of living in a conflict region um, ends up working really differently on people. And you heard maybe a little bit of reference to fear when the rebels came and took Goma in that first uh, clip I showed from Art on the Front Line. And there's a sense that in the face of fear, what people actually need to do is, is really take action. Um, because nobody's going to do it for them. And that's been proven time and time and time again. And these communities have relied on humanitarian aid. And when things get escalated, all of the aid workers are evacuated. And people are left there on their own. So there's a real sense that it's not safe to rely on other people. And that if something comes up and it's really, it, it, it's an escalated situation, everybody has to rely on themselves to a certain extent. There's also precedent uh, by the founder of this organization and a couple of other artists in the region who have really taken a stance and at times um, had to flee the country uh, for their political stance. But there's a sort of precedent, at least in this part of the, of the arts and cultural community in the east of Congo that says you have a social obligation as an artist or as somebody who's speaking out through the medium of art to, to really uh, capitalize on the power of whatever medium that you're, that you're using and not just sort of experiment but, but really um, understand that it's, you know, that it's a powerful medium of communicating and that, that perhaps there is fear but perhaps that's not important enough to override you know, the urgency of the message. And again, that's my observation. I don't want to you know, put those words in anybody's mouth but that's what I've been able to observe for quite some time. Good question. politicians that everybody likes? It's <laughs> a question for you, Petna. I, I can't think of one. Um, uh, that's an interesting question. So, so the organization clearly maintains a non-political stance. Um, and one of the reasons that it's been able to gain as much, as much momentum as it has is because culture was perceived as harmless for so long until the movement was so big that the politicians went, Oh, wait, something huge is happening there. We can't gather 15,000 people at a rally. Let's go see if Yole Africa will gather people for us. And the answer is categorically no. It doesn't matter who you represent or why you represent them. That's not something that the organization does. But politicians have come to understand that it's a really important organization and have tried then to do you know, the traditional gesture of, of, of creating positive affiliation. And the organization has maintained a stance of, um, of doing what's officially appropriate with governing bodies because of what they represent in the government. If there's a governor who, you know, or a government that needs to give, you know, permission for a large gra gathering or whatnot, we'll get that, but it's not from the person, it's from the office. Uh, so that's, that's the best, um, that's the best answer that I can give you. Politics is such a volatile thing and there's so much disappointment all of the time. There's so much corruption and there's so much denunciation, as you can see, um, that it, it hasn't, uh, it hasn't yet emerged as you know, a, a sense of people really unifying around any given politician. There are also activities that, that um, I didn't even get to talk about, the Salam Kivu International Film Festival. That's the biggest annual event. And it's organized around a theme each year. Some of the themes that you heard in these songs, Justice, for example, was the theme of a recent edition of the festival. So a lot of the songs and the performances that come out for a while are based on the theme of the festival. And there have been a couple of editions of the festival, and there will be a few more, that deal with, um, deal with democracy and have created opportunities for people to really investigate what is their own relationship with democracy, what does it mean to vote. Politicians have a habit in Congo of trying to buy votes with sugar and t-shirts and milk and all those other things. And, and the idea isn't not to take the sugar or the milk, but the idea is that, that that's not the equivalent of a vote. Um, and so to get people to start to think about what is their role and what is the role of civil society and all of that. So in these sort of abstract ways to get people to engage but not you know, lobbying for or against any particular
So I'll be happy to talk to anybody else briefly afterwards if there are more questions or people want more information. Yole Africa has a website that you're welcome to visit. Yole is spelled Y-O-L-E, as you can see here. At the, uh, the website is www.yoleafrica.org, uh, without the exclamation point. Um, Art on the Front Line is easy to search on YouTube. All of the episodes are there. If a month from now you realize you have a question, you can access myself and other representatives of Yule Africa through either the Yule Africa website or through uh, messaging any of the affiliated projects that we have. And we love to talk to people about this at any time. So thank you so much for having me here. on the 31st of March for some uh, 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 music from Syria, which is another place of conflict. And uh, thank you for your attendance. Good night.